My Mickey, do you want to kick us off? Yes. Hello, everyone. I will share my screen. Hopefully, you're seeing the right screen. Yep. Yeah. Do you want to bring up okay. the agenda? And then we can Is this the agenda you're seeing? No. We're seeing your Google search for Spire. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, share full desktop. So, yeah. We've yep. got a few things on the agenda today. Pat will be talking about the 1.9.3 release. Um, would you like to start, Pat, or should we go through the whole agenda and then? No, I'll start. Do you want to? You can jump in at the end for FluentCon uh, promotion, seeing as you're going to be talking. Mm -hmm. um, and if anyone's got any questions while we go through, we, we can cover those. Because um, I had a question for you, Dennis, actually, on your Coproc stuff. Yep. Um, just a catch up if, if it's got anywhere or if you're still, you know, obviously with the Heroku stuff, you're probably a little bit busy at the moment. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, so the 1.9.3 release should be out. Um, I think the current plan is to tag it today, so hopefully it'll be out tomorrow. Um, when you say to tag it today, for me, that normally means uh, Eduardo pings me at like 4 a.m. my time to say, yeah, it's all going. Yeah, so... Uh, it will be it will be tomorrow probably before it's out. Um, the release automation is pretty good now, I, if I say so myself. So it doesn't take very long to sort that out. Um, it, there's nothing major, I don't think, in it. Um, uh, I was just had a quick look, but I think mostly it's bug fixes. There's some issues with exec um, where it basically doesn't work for intervals and, and things like that. So that have been that should be fixed, and there are a few other things trying to sneak in. So there's a milestone in the issues if if you want to have a look at. Um, so I think Eduardo is just finishing off some of those PRs to try and get them in. Um, I just wanted to highlight someone submitted a PR yesterday for the the Android system log reader. I don't know what it is, but it's the log D, I think it is. So there's, there's a PR open on that. Um, one thing that came out of that actually was um, coding style guidelines that are not documented enough, really. So there's, there's a load of comments raised on it. Um, but we need to make it a bit, bit clearer. So I was chatting with some of the, the maintainers today about we're probably going to try and sort of pull that together and propose it to the community a bit. So like there's a few comments saying, oh, we, this is how we do it, but it's not really documented anywhere. So it's a bit cheeky to then raise that in a review. You haven't done this thing that you don't know about. So uh, we, we, we just wanted to, mm -hmm. to capture some of that. Um, yeah, yeah, so that's... One That's thing it. I saw in that PR is he seems to do some translating from numbers into letters uh, for oh, the priorities, etc. I didn't like that. We don't do that in other plugins, like the system D plugins. No, because numbers are generally easier to like, um, alert on or whatever. But I raise a comment if you want, Dennis. It's, it's probably... Yeah, I, I was going to, but then got distracted with work. Yeah, I yeah, know no, what you mean. Uh, for me, I didn't really look too much at it. I just looked at like the CI side. Like, does it does it build for the targets? Do we need any extra stuff? Yeah. Um, um, so yeah, because also this some of the builds take a very long time, and like if we keep adding more stuff to all of them when it's not really required, it's it's a pain. So I just to... is there an Android build that is uh, built with CI, or is it more of a uh, people can build it themselves if they want it? Yeah, there's no Android build as far as I'm aware at the moment. I mean, we could add one if we can do it with a container so we can run it on GitHub Actions. Um, I'm more than happy to, if someone wants to propose that. Because I, I had the same issue with the Windows build. Like, we've got Windows containers defined, but they weren't ever being built. So what's the point? Like, they don't stay, like, you know, you, you, there's mm. no guarantee they actually work. So, like, if, if we're including stuff, we really should should have some kind of, like, let's test it works. But then there's a few others, like the Octo stuff and things like that. I think you've looked at Mickey before. Some of that stuff we don't build in CI, but we sort of provide and rely on it being reasonably accurate. Yes, well, actually, what you're having there on your screen now is the bit that I um, don't necessarily yeah. agree with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's fair enough. Then raise, raise that, because maybe someone's missed it. Um, because uh, I guess a lot of the other maintainers might be looking at, like, you know, the, is there any errors or like the, the style yeah. and stuff like that. But, if there's some, I don't know, but it's good to have someone contributing like this whole thing. So, yeah, I, I try to be positive with my 
criticism as well so like, like we do need to change this but it, it's good to, to have it as well so yeah um so yeah i just want to highlight that in case people are interested and like this is how you can kind of contribute some new plugins if you want to do it like you dennis um so yeah you, you might want to have a look at the style guide <laughs> <laughs> I'll have a look at the style guide. Most of the thing I wrote that you're going to ask about is just a copy paste of existing code. So it should follow the style guide. Uh... Well, you say that and then people go, it shouldn't be done this way. I know it was done this way in that one, but it shouldn't be. <laughs> yeah, oh, that sounds very familiar with uh, all, all kinds of code. Like grandfathered in kind of problems. Yep. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. What I, so. I saw this on the, the GitHub blog, actually. One of the labs has produced this uh, repo visualizer. So I thought, oh, I'll have a look what that looks like for um, for for Fluent Bit. And, and actually, there's an action to edit. So I've added an action to, to auto to edit to the readme and, and keep it updated. Um, it just needs merging. Um, if you look at the files change there, I think. Oh, hi. You can have a look at the actual diagram. The interesting thing I found with that is like the, the largest bubbles for source are all the vendor dependencies. Mm -hmm. so there's, yeah, there's quite a lot of effort managing stuff that's not core. Um, so it's it's interesting to see. It's good to see there's a big bubble of tests as well. That's always good. Um, um, but yeah, like most of it's in, in some of the, the vendor dependencies. Uh, so yeah, so so I've got this, so there's an action now. So when, when you push something to, to the master branch, it should update the, the diagram as well and, and submit pull requests. So uh, we just need to get that in. But what is the goal of having this diagram? I just wanted to show, it's just part of the documentation of the, oh, okay. the re, yeah, there's no real, I was just like, it's something I've been complaining about with Flipbit for a while. It's like there's no sort of architectural overview or like easy way of viewing how things should be put together. Uh, particularly when you're doing PRs, like when you're reviewing it, like yeah. it works this way. Is that the way it was intended to work, or is that just the way it's like being implemented? Um, so is it a problem or not? You know, and those kind of things. So, so we're just trying to look at some of these kind of tools where we can generate those kind of things, at least some information. Um, and, and hopefully it will be of use to people. Um, I was going to look at look at some of the others, but this was just this was quite an easy one. I thought, yeah, it, it might be useful for some people, so let's just include it for, for now. And if it's not, we can drop it out. It's a big deal. I like that it shows at a glance that most plugins are of roughly equal size. Yeah, there's, so there's like little little nuggets of information in there that, that are quite useful. Yeah. Um, particularly if you did a change where you like you massively increased the size of something or shrunk it, you've kind of got an argument for for approving or rejecting that change as well. Then potentially, um, or saying like, okay, we could improve this area by spending X amount of effort, but we could spend the same effort improving this other area and have much better benefit kind of thing. So there's a few things like that, but that's all gets into like project management mm -hmm. stuff. So uh, yeah, I try to avoid avoid that. Um, so yeah, I just, just want to show, if anyone's got any other ones, so like, I think you, Mickey, highlighted, what was it? Uh, course. course, is it? Yeah, it's pronounced course, I guess. Um, I will show you a quick example of it running. Of course is fun, but I don't see any use in it besides it being fun. Yeah, it, it literally is just fun. Yeah, so it's currently showing like the start of the repository and how it's evolving over time. I guess you could add like avatars for people so we could be aware of who's actually contributing. And then you kind of, I think it's happening too fast at this point, but you get a sense for what's actually being added to the repo as well. So can time. you do it like for a time period? I wonder like at FluentCon, yeah. you could say, well, like since the last FluentCon, this is what's happened. Or, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, we could totally do that, yeah. Yeah, it's, it accepts tons of arguments to do filtering and uh, output uh, options. Yeah, because I think that's, from the beginning, it's probably like a little excessive. <laughs> when was the last Fluent Con? Do you remember? Uh, October, was it? November? I can't remember. October, let's call, let's say December. Oh, there we go. So this is, this is something that's happened since November 2021. It looks super active. 
as you might expect, I guess. Yeah, well, it probably highlights the areas of change as well and things like that. Um, I don't see you, you floating about, but I'm sure you're there somewhere. <laughs> it's very hard yeah. to see anything floating about now. Yeah. yeah. The you current state it. of the repo. Yeah, if you yeah. Look at it's, just, it's just all like CI stuff, and most of them are like implement this, and then the next one is fix what I just implemented because it doesn't work in one case. <laughs> So there's a lot of commits, but they probably could have been smaller. But yeah. Do we squash um, our commits for, for these kinds of things? I, sorry? I'm, I haven't looked at the repo and I'm not sure, like, do we squash commits? Do we keep the history quite tidy? Yeah, I think, I think we try to, to, to squash the commits. It's, certainly for miners, there can be, particularly on the CI, I've got a bit, this is a, a bugbear for GitHub reusable workflows, but you have to specify things like the branch that they run on. So sometimes to test them, you have to like hard code the branch in. And so I'll have a commit where I change the branch to my current branch, run the test and then revert it. So it's um, so you can kind of see like it would work once we merge it to master um, kind of kind of thing. So there's yeah, so I try to make sure I squash mine because there's a lot of stuff in there. You're like I did this, I did that, and it's not relevant to the to the overall change. I think. Yeah, that's my biggest pet peeve with having CI config in the repo, no matter if it's GitHub Actions or anything else. If you ever <coughs> want to fix your CI, you're making messy commits basically on your main branch. Yeah, it gets a bit, and then you've got like, why well, we've got like per branch CI as well, which is even worse to like figure out. So yeah. right, I started going, no, we'll just keep everything on the default branch and it will apply to the other branches rather than, oh, this one's doing this on 1.8 and doing that on 1.9. And it's like, you, you can't tell unless you can look at the look at the specific action on the specific branch. Um, and also some of the actions only work on the default branch or they have like weird behaviors where they run from the default but apply to another branch. So it gets a bit, a bit strange. So yeah, I started trying to simplify it a little because it's a bit crazy. Um, but yeah, if anyone's got any other suggestions for, for stuff we could get out, like, yeah, so as I say, for me, it was like, when I was trying to understand Fluent Bit and like how all the components should work together, particularly when I want to like, I want to customize a bit of behavior or, or do something, it was like, well, what's the architecture? What should it, you know, what are the interfaces and kind of stuff? And yeah, you can look at the code, but you need to understand C and the, you know, it, it's like, and the code is how it's implemented, not necessarily the intended design. So it's like it's that kind of stuff would be nice to have. Um, but that's certainly been a barrier for me, actually, uh, just getting getting a sense for how it's all structured and what the, arch the intended architecture is. Yeah, and I think it depends on the person as well. Some people are very good at like, like personally, I don't like looking at the code and figuring it out. I prefer like. The, the, the sort of diagram view or, or the high level and then delving in, but other people prefer the opposite. And I think we need to support both. Mm -hmm. I'm usually one who will dive into the code first to figure out what I, what I need to do to make it work the way I want to. Uh, but even then, especially with a bit of C code that is not very well documented, it is useful to have this kind of, just the, the, that little diagram of, hey, this is where the plugins are, this is where the main stuff is. Uh, so See. yeah. C also has this problem with uh, ownership, particularly of like pointers and stuff like that. So like the kind of contracts on some of the APIs are yeah. just not, not documented. Like who's responsible? Is that pointer transferred? Is it, you know, is, 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 is how is it working? And that's that's where we get all your memory leaks and, you know, yeah. race conditions and stuff like that. So we could, could do with, with, with getting some of that a bit more. Like this is the API and this is the contract on it. Like we can't really enforce it in C, um, but this is what it should do. And, and as part of the review process, you can say, right, has, has the ownership been transferred as it should be? And is it then cleaned up in the right place? Or, or is it, you know, vice versa? So I think we could do with a bit more of that. But of course, it's open source and like, there's all these good things we want to do, but it's getting time and people's effort to, to do it. It's, it's we don't have an infinite number of people. Yeah. And it's like, obviously, it's better to fix bugs, but some of the bugs are in like documentation. Or, or, you know, understanding the design. So it's, it's just getting that out. Um, but yeah, if you guys have any other suggestions, I'd be, I'd be interested to see what we can get in there and, and, and give an overview. It doesn't have to be versions of repo, but maybe there's some tools that, that make it 
but we could generate diagrams or other stuff from. I've tended to favor automated ones just because they tend to stay up to date and where a snapshot kind of, this is what it looked like in 1995, and then everything's changed since then. There was this thing from GitHub, I believe. Um, yeah, so, can... so I've used that in, it, it's a little bit limited at the moment because it only does certain types of diagrams. Because um, I, I, there's some cases where I'd like a bit more freeform diagrams rather than UML ones. Um, yeah. So like if you go to the pull request 4875, um, You're testing, you know. used it to kind of try and explain the automated build process that we want to do. It, it works reasonably well there, but there's, <laughs> yeah, if you scroll down to the overview, so nice. that's, that's a way diagram. Nice. Uh, but there is, it's like, I kind of bastardized the syntax to sort of this is what like the the process but i don't want a sequence diagram i don't want a like a state chart i want just a like a, gen, a slightly more free form you know visio diagram or something like that where i can just draw some boxes and and have them connected um which is how yeah. it's kind of bastardized you might have come across the tool called excala draw as well which is very There's quite a few, quite a few out there so yeah in previous roles i've done the model driven development and stuff like that with um, rapidly and stuff like that, which is pretty good if you do it properly and things like that. But if you just use it to go for a paint, it's, it's not so good. Yeah. But anyway, probably a separate thing. Um, oh, and the other thing. So I think uh, Anya Rag mentioned it last time. So we've got this like sandbox environment, which is based on instruct. Um, so it just spins up. Um, and you can do like training modules with it. So the idea is we, we've got like a fluent bit 101, which is quite an Americanism, um, fluent bit basics kind of thing. Um, so you can have like your own sandbox environment and you work through some exercises and it goes, yeah, you've done that. And, and actually what, what Anurag's been using it for is just testing things out like, how does this work and does it like that? Cause it just spins up a nice, you know, Kubernetes, I think it's a K3S cluster underneath. Um, for Mickey, you. if you go back to the agenda and scroll a bit further down, you'll see Anurag oh. links to it. Yeah, it's right at the bottom of that page. There we are. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. So, so I've been capturing, so this, like, I don't know if you guys noticed, but in Slack, you get basically the same questions quite often. They'll be worded differently, you know, oh, I, yeah. blah, blah, blah. You know, I've got this very specific thing to, and it's not working. But ultimately, the problem is, like, you haven't done X or you need to configure Y. So what I've been doing is trying to capture those kind of things. And I'm thinking I'll, I'll try and make very simple modules for like, this is how you configure like the file output plugin to send files in a named way or something, you know, just a very specific use case. Um, yeah, so the, I very, the very common questions are the, um, how do I route to different endpoints yeah. per uh, input? So uh, different system D servers or different uh, containers or namespaces to different Elasticsearch namespaces, Splunk indexes, et cetera. Exactly. Yeah. Very that, that's one that really could use a uh, a sandbox. Well, anyone can do this. So we it, they just get repos underneath. So it's just a case of, of of if we can put some nice ones together. Because quite often I'll re I'll reply with just a like, oh, you need to do this, and that's all the time you've got yeah. to do it. So I just want to spend a bit more time to like, if I put a nice example together, I can point them at that, and then they can sort of experiment with a working system and and sort of change it to yeah. to their solution. Um, rather than say just some generic advice, go read the docs uh, and figure it out. So yeah, I've been trying yeah. to capture that. It's very but, powerful. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it looks quite good. So I think the CNCF are paying for, for you know, sponsoring that, that instance. Um, that's pretty good. So we're going to try and do, um, you know, some of the workshops we've got coming up at FluentCon, which is probably a nice lead into it. Going to see if we can get some of those going in in uh, instruct so then people can can rather than having to set up their own kubernetes environment or you know locally and all the dev stuff and we can say oh here's here's a working one you can play around with it if you want to use it in like in your aws instance you can kind of you know translate it from there but at least we, we don't have to support 
10 different, oh, I'm trying to use it in EKS version 0.2 or something, and it's not working. We, we can just have a, a nice platform that's, this is it working. You can experiment and then maybe pull the config over. Um, so I think it will it'll help a little bit with that, making like reproducible examples. So I was going to have a look at that. But yeah, if you guys want uh, access to, to set up modules, just give us a shout and, and we can sort that. Yeah, we'll have a think about it for sure. Yeah. Because the other one I wanted to look at was like Windows, but I don't know if they can support that target. Um, mm -hmm. There's a few questions come up like, uh, and I've not really used Windows and, and like getting it set up on my local machine is not going to happen. So, so, yeah, is there something we can do so we can just have a Windows track as well? And that would be quite nice. Yeah. Maybe something about the Yocto and Bitbake would be nice as well. Maybe yeah, I think at some point you've kind of got, it's limited. I think it runs on like AWS yeah. or something underneath. So there's, there's kind of a limit to what it can do, but, but if we, we, can, we, can, we can see how we get there. It looks pretty straightforward. But like there are examples for like how you create a new module and stuff, you know, spin up your environment. It's all pretty, as it should be, you know, infrastructure as code is trivial. It's, it's quite a nice, nice setup. Did you get to talk about the Raspberry Pi setup that you're working on, the Raspbian stuff? Yeah, so uh, I, I'm actually meant to put that in the agenda. So a UK company has given us a discount for open source usage of their Raspberry Pi as a service, uh, mythicpiece.com, I think they're, they're called. Um, so they gave us a nice discount to say, you know, you can have a server for, you know, 50% off. Um, for open source, yeah, this one, because yeah. um, there's a few issues in the in the backlog, and I can't really investigate them without the hardware, and you can't buy the hardware. So I've got some Raspberry Pis on order for Calypso, but their current estimated delivery date is November. Um, so, yeah. so this looks like a much nicer way of just like I only need it every now and then. I just want like a quick go in, install like Fluid Bits version X, check it's running or, you know, check this config and, and then just wipe it afterwards. So it looks, you know, through the web interface and they've got an API as well. Um, and it, you know, I did a quick, like, I set up their virtual desktop one so you can have like Raspberry Pi running a, a, a GUI and you can, you know, um, um, well, what's the BNC in? Um, and, and get it if you want to do that. And obviously you can just have the shell as well. So it looked it look quite useful for that kind of debug and test. Because most issues we find are with like stuff, because we do container builds, stuff leaking from the host into configuration for that, for that target. So a lot of the time it's like, we just need to override that value, but we don't know what that value is and without the hardware. So it's, it's those kind of things. Because we had a few like that with um, the ARM64 CentOS and Fedora targets, they have a different page file size, I think. Um, and and th so the, the, the artifacts we were building were just not usable. Um, so it was just a case of like, has someone configured that page file size like for their specific target? Or was that the default that all of those targets get? And in which case we should support it. So, and it's impossible to find like that kind of detail in docs. It's just easier to bar just you know, spin up a machine and, and see what that value is rather than like try and figure out where that could be documented. Um, so. But yeah, this is the, these are the guys who did it. Yeah, they look, look quite nice. I was going to see if I can plummet because the other thing we need to do for integration and resilience testing is need to start testing more of these targets, like the actual targets. Um, like, so I want to start spinning like VMs up of the different OSs putting fluent bit on it and running some basic tests on it and maybe doing some soap tests and things like that. Um, but also for some of these targets, it's going to be a bit tricky to do that in AWS. But these guys have got an API that lets you like spin up new servers. So uh, looking at how we can use that with maybe with GitHub Actions or whatever to say, uh, spin up, spin me up a new server and then run these tests on it uh, would be quite nice. Um, but we'll see. Um, it's paying all those bills as well as is the problem yeah and i guess we're down to our last point 
Europe. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's happening. Less than a month. Less than a month. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be speaking at it, as you know, virtually. Uh, assuming I record the talk before tomorrow, should all be good. You have to hand in your talk three weeks in advance? Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I did that for the last one as well. Um, it was very short notice because I was, you know, I, I intended to come along and then it turned out I couldn't. So, yeah. I'll be uh, watching it uh, on on the streams. I will not be in uh, Valencia. Well, I think Mickey will be in Valencia just as <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'll be there as well. I'm there a week. Um, well, hopefully the flight is very quick transfer in Amsterdam, so we'll see if I make it Sunday night or not. Um, but yeah. Anything oh, you? I don't think we've got the free the free beer mugs anymore. Mickey, by the way, I think they uh, the printers couldn't print them in time or something. Oh. Unfortunately, and yeah, it's quite a few things there. Yeah, so there's a couple of those workshops. Uh, so I'm running the fluent operator one, but that's just because the guys are in um, aren't going to be there in person. Um, oh yeah, nice one. So hopefully, then that, that's one. I think that one of the metrics one we're looking at, if we can put it in the sandbox, because that'd be quite useful then, just general. Yeah, you, you've done it once, you don't have to keep doing it. Oh, there is a community meeting, there we go. It's on the schedule. Oh, yeah. And then you're done. Yeah. At least, you, at least you're not right after lunch, because that's always the worst slot. Right after lunch, everybody's having their sugar crash, so nobody's yeah. paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I want less eyes on me, to be completely honest. It's going to be my first talk pretty much ever, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, also, anyone watching, I'll be there. Um, so if you want to come along, say hi. Give us a shout. Yeah. Um, hi guys, uh, I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this is Akshar from India. I just wanted to ask, uh, so this FluentCon is co-hosted along with Fluent, uh, sorry, KubeCon, is it? Mm -hmm. Or are these separate events? Yeah. They're, they're hosted uh, they're not together. Sub no, they're not separate. Okay, they're, okay. It's, it's co-located. So there's a whole load of other ones. There's like a, an Envoy Con, a Prometheus Con. Um, Very cool. I can't remember all the different ones. GitOps Con and uh, Edge Con, I think, for Kubernetes on Edge or something like that. Um, so yeah, so you've got KubeCon Wednesday to Friday, and then Monday and Tuesday you have these co-located events. Okay, I see. Um... Are, are they going to be clashing or are, are they going to be uh, interleaved? So, or... so Monday and Tuesday are dedicated to the co-located events, but there are multiple co-located events, so there may be clashes if you want to go to things that are running at the same time. Oh, so, I see. Okay. So yeah. Fluent Cons on the Monday, um, I think, oh yeah, it shows, shows what's, what's on Monday and what's on Tuesday. So I think they try and like, if there's sort of ones that people might want to go to, you know, the same people might want to go to them, I think they try and split them on different days, but um, they can get no guarantee. Okay, okay I have uh, another question. Uh, so uh, is Fluentbit primarily targeted towards uh, Kubernetes uh, or is it, uh, I know you've uh, mentioned about Android, uh, but what is the other main, uh, use case for Fluentbit. Uh, I'm just trying to learn Fluentbit uh, with Kubernetes, so just uh, how do they ask it? I mean, that's hard for, I think, any of us to answer in general, but it started off as embedded, um, and there's, there's a significant usage commercially as non-containers. 
so that, that's probably the, the best answer I, I could come up with. Yeah. So we're just a single customer. I work for GitHub and we're just a single customer, but we use it both in Kubernetes and on bare metal servers. Um, okay. uh, to, to forward system D logs, for, for example. I wouldn't call Fluentbit um, just a Kubernetes thing. <laughs> definitely not. Yeah, definitely. We, we use it on the edge and we use it in Kubernetes, for example. Yeah. What do you mean with on the edge? Okay. Like the embedded, uh, uh... embedded device, yeah. yeah. Sort of NVIDIA platform. Yeah. Okay, okay. And I say that, yeah, working well, working well for an embedded stateless solution also means it works quite well for a low resource Kubernetes solution as well. Yeah. Um, which is probably where it sort of, that's why it's gained a lot of popularity just because it's, it's been adopted that way. Yeah. But it certainly started as a, as a non-container embedded solution. Okay. And Elastic Search is the primary uh, uh, destination for sending the logs, I suppose, right? Uh, or is, do we have any other? No, it's not. I would say it's it's not. That's what the Helm chart defaults to, I think, at the moment. Okay. But the point is, it, it's it's. I know of... it's flexible, but I'm just asking yeah. a general uh, practical use case uh, scenario wise. Um, people primarily use yeah, Open Search is spin off of Elastic. Yeah. So also, if you look at like the Grafan, like the the Loki stack, um, they provide a, a Helm chart that installs Fluent Bit and sends it to the to Loki. Um, oh, okay. So For quite... us, it's all about Kafka. Everything goes into Kafka, or even straight into yeah. Splunk from Fluent Bit. There's no less Splunk, search yeah, at all. Splunk's a good shout as well because you can you can do a lot of filtering as well before it gets to Splunk to reduce yeah. the cost and things like that. <laughs> So okay. one of the reasons for us to actually adopt Fluentbit is to do all that filtering because we had a lot of magic inside Splunk that nobody had any insights to because uh, Splunk is a beast to maintain. And with Fluentbit, we actually give uh, application owners the, uh, the the full control over how their logs are processed before they end up in Kafka and then Splunk. Yeah, and I've actually, I did it for OpenShift, but a while ago I did, uh, I'll post it in the chat. Um, a repo where I use the Helm chart to send it to different endpoints. Um, okay. So I've got Elastic Cloud and Grafana Cloud and data dog there. Um, um, so I, I think the point is it's it's not tied to any vendor, and that's that's one of the, the good points is that, that then you can target multiple destinations because I've seen people as well use it for like developers want all the logs. That's fine. Okay, we're maybe in a short ring buffer so they don't fill up huge amounts of space but then you've got security teams who want audit logs in like you know um write once file systems and stuff like that you know so where you can't you um you can't um edit it afterwards or post intrusion stuff so there's a few use cases and, and things as well where you want to evaluate okay we're using elastic search at the moment um let me send it to loki as well and see mm. what the benefits are I don't need to change I don't need to install another agent to do that and configure it and stuff like that. Uh, you can do some evaluation. Oh. Like that. Okay, cool. Well, thank you, thank you guys. That's all right. It's all it's that's all my opinions. It's not official. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah the okay. um the evaluating angle is a good one to call out as well. That is a uh very useful thing having multiple outputs for your logs yeah and it's one of the reasons i did the openshift one as well because openshift are moving from elastic to loki um and it's like potentially you could you could do that yourself and, and evaluate the sort of the trade-offs and, and, and see if it's what you want to do so yeah yeah i didn't end up using it for that uh, with our use case but yeah that's definitely something i would have done now yeah so previously in couchbase i put together an observability stack which was sort of low-key based um just because it was a lot more performant than the elastic option um and and cheaper so i'm i'm a fairly big fan of low-key at the moment Well, also now they've sorted it out of all the rights. 
that was the only that was the main stumbling block we had until they fixed it have they fixed it you sent me a pr the other day yeah they so loki 2.4 supports out all the rights but there's still some issues um with time windows and stuff you can't send out order rights that are like wildly disparate in like 24 hour periods or whatever it's like oh here's here's some logs from two days ago here's a log from now you know it, it, it doesn't like that but that's just a local thing a loki thing it tends to have like a window of like this is when i'll accept logs uh logs from so um i can't remember what the defaults are so sometimes yeah. actually yeah in my talk i talk about datadog and loki as examples of things that basically have this concept of a window where, where it's like between 18 hours and 36 hours. And that's yeah. why I make a case for like using something like open search or elastic, because I guess you have more flexibility in controlling the index. Yeah. Maybe you could do, do something like, like we're talking about doing a calypso with like, we can push to a location and replay it later. Um, so you could have an in cluster location and then uh, forward it once you, you're connected and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, there's a few things like that. Um, that's the, I, that would be generally how I'd tell it. Like, if it won't allow it, well, we'll get around that by uh, forcing it to allow it in some other horrible, complex way. Yeah, I have yeah. actually called out that rebasing script that you showed me. I didn't end up using it, but like there's a Lua script somewhere in the Calyptia repo that I think it's used for testing, but it like rebases the timestamps. Oh no, that's from that's from Couchbase. Yeah, one of the Couchbase guys did. Yeah, that. yeah, I think I. Yeah, because we. So that was for CI testing because we wanted to play the logs through, and we didn't want the timestamps to change. Um, so we, but we had to change them to make sure they came within the window so it was yeah so we had like sample input but you then needed to force the timestamps to to be within the low key window um, yeah so yeah it was a bit it's a bit of faff so it's a bit like like with everything you can solve everything with lua uh, but whether you should do <laughs> is, the, is the main question yeah. yeah that's the downside of lua you can do too many things with it yeah i was speaking to anyrag about this actually because um like sometimes it you can do a lot in Lua um, and it might actually be better just to do it as one filter than like oh I'm going to use the modify filter and the grep filter and the that's that's how I do the uh, the cube stuff I had mm -hmm. a um couple of nests and nests and more things to filter out things I mean in the end I took all of that out and replaced it with a single Lua thing yeah, especially now you've got. Oh, I probably should have mentioned that actually in one nine three the the inline Lua code config. Uh, oh, um, because that was that was always my problem with it. It's like then you have to manage, um, and I think it was a question from Google where they had um, they had different configs for different environments. But then if they were using Lua scripts, then that was modified like ten times because then you have to mount all these different Lua scripts in different places on different environments. So they just said, can we just all have it in one file, uh, just in the config file, because we have to manage that anyway. Um, so that's in there now. Um, but yeah, Anurag was saying as well, like you, you get a bit of a benefit from the pack and unpack. You know, if you've got lots of filters in between each yeah. one, it has to pack and unpack it. Um, so if you're just doing that once, it might, it might be slightly better. Um, so it depends really. I was like, is it easier to write the Lua? It comes down to like what's more maintainable. I, I would be my opinion. Like some some people will find it easier to write regexes. I don't understand those people. Um, we, we had to do a couple of things that weren't possible with filters anyway. So we had we to do Lua, and then it really makes sense to rip out all the other stuff and do it in Lua as yeah, well. Yeah. That's it. And it's like if 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 you're having to use Lua anyway, maybe you can just use it uh, for, for yeah. everything kind of thing. So yeah. Yeah. It, it, there is like the psychological barrier to entry where it's like oh lua i haven't really seen this language i don't know how it works is it complex like what do i need what is the interface like maybe yeah. regexes are the things i use because that's what i do in my bash scripts and so that, yeah that's definitely why we started with just filters now nobody had ever touched lua before i had to learn lua for fluent bit yeah. but it's such a simple language Exactly. Uh, that really isn't a barrier to entry. 
it's just someone needs to tell you it's a simple language because yeah. i don't know like i actually was stuck like thinking it's this own it's its own thing i have to learn this whole new thing yeah until i actually looked at it and there was a video on youtube that was like lua in two minutes and i was like oh okay i i get it and maybe good things to link to from the fluent bit documentation mm, yeah 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 you can submit some prs for that that might be useful because the other thing i was concerned about as well was performance like interpreted languages you know is it going to be terrible like when yeah. you run out of scale um, but actually that was probably one of the benefits of the first fluent con eu loads of like Amazon people and stuff were like, we use Lua and we're running 70 yeah. billion, million, jillion, whatever events through it every second and it's fine. Um, so I was like, okay. You know, it's kind of that whole premature optimization problem. You're like, <laughs> I won't use this, I'll make this really complicated regex and that's actually probably worse. So, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, as long as, I mean, I'm talking about the bare metal house, but as long as Fluent Bit is uh, way lower in CPU usage than uh, Journal D, we're fine. <laughs> Actually, that was probably another one to put in the, the training modules, because there was that question the other day about using System D, and I think the guy was using multiple System D inputs. Yeah, um, I've already put uh, uh, the, the, the suggestion in that discussion that uh, Anurag uh, opened. Oh, right, okay. Uh, yeah, because was it like 21 system D inputs? Or? Yeah, 21 system D inputs because he uh, misunderstood wow. uh, the way Obviously. these things work. That was not, yeah. He could have used the unit filter, I guess, or? Well, um, the, the filter that you have in the system D input will only uh, allow you to exclude certain things, but he, he had a separate system D input uh, for each individual service where he had an inclusion filter. But that's not the way these things work, because the system D input will read everything and then, then just filter out these things. So he had 21 inputs reading all the system D logs, mm -hmm. which, yeah, um, is going to make some things on your system fairly unhappy. Yeah, I think he ran out of file descriptors. Was the, yeah, the yeah. I had that once where I had Fluentbit run out of file descriptors. I didn't realize that um, Fluentbit also read all the user uh, logs, like anything under var log system D owned by a user which is every um, every time you log into a server, it opens one of those. Uh, so on our shell servers, there was thousands of them. Oh, nice. Yeah. Because um, also, yeah. Um, going back to open, so like OpenShift as well has a, unless you configure the security context and stuff like that, if you have to explicitly allow individual containers more than the default number of limits. And so the default yeah. limit is 1024. And you actually have to like, patch the machine config and things like that to get it to use more than that and yeah so it was i was reading actually like uh fluent d has like this deployment section and config well i think it was somewhere in the deployment section where it actually talks about file descriptors and things like this and i don't think the fluent bit documentation covers this as well like for example high availability setups hmm. i could be wrong but could be nice to have something like this for a fluent bit. Yeah, I remember the problem with it is writing the documentation in such a way that it's it's both useful and correct for every case. And that's where it gets tricky. Because um, yeah, people will be running like some lockdown OS where it's like, you know, set to one is the maximum file script that you can have or something like that. And it gets a bit, yeah. a bit messy. Yeah. All right, that's probably enough of that tangent. Um, anything yeah. else people want to cover? Oh, yeah, your Coproc PR, Dennis. Is it anywhere moved forward since last time, or is it is it still in the back burner? Uh, it's in the back burner. I was planning to do some fluent bit stuff last week, <laughs> um, but yeah, that clearly didn't happen. Now, I want to finish those other two PRs first. One of them has been lingering for almost a year now. Oh, right. What are those ones? Uh, there was a small bug fix somewhere and some metrics things that I added, but both of them are waiting for me, not for uh, any anybody on the Fluent Bit side. Okay. Yeah, it's just more if you get them done. I can always yeah, bug you. They put this in the release today, kind of hit 193 if it if it turns up. 
Yeah, if it's small enough as well, not if it's like some humongous. Story. Um, no, nah, it's not urgent enough to go into a release now. We also don't run any released version. We have we use a patched version of one point eight point something with some uh, custom patches that are definitely not upstreamable. Okay. Yeah, just weirdly, I've just got a notification about another PR that's about. Uh... Oh, so one thing that I. And I'm not going to say I don't like it, but it irks me a little bit, is that these docs required labels that automatically get added. Anytime oh, yeah. you open a PR, something adds that docs required label, and that's that feels a bit pushy. Yeah, and also people just ignore it, because like, with like the log, the Android one, there's no, there's no docs had to raise it. It's on the template. People should be adding docs for stuff. Um, yeah. I don't know if it's... If it's been been used, been used, I just I, I don't you know, I just ignore it and, and remove it from the ones I think don't need docs. Um, yeah, I can't it. remove labels though. That needs some other permissions. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I guess it was it was before my time, so I'm not sure what the 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 original reason it went in was maybe just to try and make sure that we were, we were getting docs added when people added new plugins and stuff like that. It makes sense. But that should be really done anyway, part of the the, the template, which also people ignore and just delete or work <laughs> it in. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I do need to drop off. My daughter has swimming lessons in half an hour, so I need to go yeah, and find a car. Yeah. Stop it, unless anyone's got anything else. Yeah. Cool. You can right, call thanks. it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Catch you later.